Hi, HRN listeners. We're celebrating our 15th anniversary, and we have a really fun campaign and an ask for you. This 15th anniversary tour is aiming to bring you closer to unique food and music experiences in some of the most exciting cities in America. All the while, we're raising funds to support our work empowering the next generation of food system storytellers through our fellowship programs. Here's how it works. Donate to HRN and be entered into a raffle in the city of your choice to win a dinner for two at a noteworthy restaurant and tickets for two to a concert at a prominent local venue. We have incredible partners in New York, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Nashville, Las Vegas, Charleston, Asheville, and Ardmore, Pennsylvania, who have donated a meal for two and two tickets to a concert of the winner's choice. And all donations help fund our fellowship programs, where we're helping to build essential workforce readiness skills and food system storytelling skills. Check out heritageradionetwork.org 15 to donate and enter to win today. That's heritageradionetwork.org 15. Thank you. Today's program has been brought to you by Fairway Market, like no other market a New York City institution that sells the best local, national, and international artisan foods for prices that can't be beat. For more information, visit fairwaymarket.com. You're listening to heritageradionetwork.org, a nonprofit, member-supported radio station. We're millions strong, with folks tuning in from over 200 countries. We are education. We are entertainment. We are the future of food. May is our membership drive. Become a member and support us while receiving e-newsletters, advanced invites, special discounts, and a membership card. We need your support. Visit our website and click the donate button to become a member today. Thank you for believing in us and enjoy the show. Story and I'm Dorothy Can Hamilton, and today we're broadcasting from the International Culinary Center, um, and we have one of New York's best chefs with us, probably one of the country's best chefs, if not the world, and one of my favorite fun people because she says lots of things just like it is, and she's probably known uh, to many of you from being on Chopped, The Best Thing I Ever Ate, all, all over the TV Food Network we, and Bravo, we have Alex Granicelli with us today. Hi, yeah. Alex, and welcome. Thank you. So, we've known each other a long time. It's I'm true. I'm so happy to have you here Thank you. today. So, um, wow. I mean, you, you know, you've really, you're, to me, you're so inspirational for, you know, this is a cooking school, and we have a lot of women who, who are here, and men. And your background, uh, you really you really paid your dues. You know, your career changer, you went to Barnard. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you started your career really working with Larry Forgione. I right? did. You did, you did. But then you went to Laverin in Paris. I did. You did. And you worked in France. Mm-hmm. And I always remember you telling me the, the stories about France. And we're going to get into that a little later on. But you've really been able to, uh, today, manage a great restaurant, be the executive chef, and do all of this media, and you're a mom. Yeah. You, you know, you're doing it all. I think there's a lot of people out there that want to understand how do you do it and what makes you tick. So let's start when you were a little kid. Mm -hmm. And you have a famous mom. I do. Food editor. And... She's iconic. What was it like growing up with an, uh, a mother who's the the iconic food editor? What kind of food did you eat in your house, and what are your food memories? Well, I would say the first way to be successful in growing up with someone iconic is to not know that they're iconic and that they're always just mom. That kind of helps the situation. Um, but I'd say, um, you know, I feel like chefs in particular, but I think everyone has a culinary identity that they base somewhat on their childhood and the sort of repertoire of dishes that they were exposed to. Um, And I would say in a lot of cases, people feel, or whether they're aware of it or not, feel that that repertoire was somewhat consistent um, 
it had a consistent message and it came from say a couple of cultural origins maybe the mother and the father or an aunt or an uncle or whomever um, but I'd say in my case um, my parents are both Italian we're, so we're an Italian American family people say to us oh you're Italian and we say we're Italian American you know we almost don't want to disrespect Italy by saying that we're true Italians um, but here's the thing I mean yeah there was this sort of parade of Italian dishes that sort of always hung around um, like what? My mom made a lot of things. My mom made a lot of sort of, um, a lot of those kind of torta di ricottas, those kind of ricotta torts, and uh, a lot of cheesecakes, very Italian-style cheesecakes, um, which, God bless, I never really cared for. There is actually something in, on the earth that I don't want to eat. <laughs> but my father really loved that. She made those things for my father, and it was really kind of so fun to watch him eat them. That you know, But they had that, that diced-up... That Candy. diced up citrus yeah, and, yeah. and everything that we, I feel is really a truly Italian flavor because it's sort of got that, that pleasant bitterness. I don't think we as Americans could really say bitter goes much beyond coffee or that we would oftentimes seek it deliberately. Is that Sicilian? Definitely. Yeah, I definitely. Say those candied, uh, oh, yeah. You can go yeah. to De Palos and, and get right. it still in right. the most beautiful form possible. So there was a lot of that, and my father. Um, sort of was much more the meatball um, and pasta domain. My mom didn't really dabble in that. And the, and the red sauce scenario was really left to my father. Um, I think it's because my father makes better tomato sauce than my mother because he understands how important a little sugar is for, for all tomatoes in the universe. Um, but he also made some sort of what he called Italian peasant dishes, so to speak, things like he would make a simple risotto with arborio rice and just add tomato sauce to it and that would be the whole dish and it was just sort of soaked in there and I had these those these sort of memories of such simple dishes and not really identifying them as Italian just identifying them as what I had last Tuesday um, but despite all that I think what was sort of confusing um, complex and overall really sort of compelling for me as a child was my mother sort of became um, Immersed in whatever manuscript she was working on, and every manuscript took she took so much time to to edit them. Um, her process really involved cooking a lot of the recipes from the book intensively over a short period of time. So, she went she did classic Indian cooking. I think in 1978, and we just ate all of Julie Sani's recipes. I mean, for months. And then my father said, "I can't have another doll. <laughs> I can't see the word garam masala." Right. Uh, again for a while and so then she got um, and I don't remember the exact order though I could look there was the year of that there was the year of the splendid table in Rosetto Casper so that was Emilia Romagna my father said if I see balsamic vinegar <sighs> or Parmigiano Reggiano I'm going to lose it I mean imagine eating so much of it that you would actually say <laughs> such such blasphemous <laughs> things and then there was uh, the year of the um, the Rose Levy Birnbaum cake bible that was a tough one um, My but, gosh, how do you work your oh, way that through was, that? Because that's, boy, that is some tone. I mean, yeah. It, I mean, first of all, you know, Rose will sift something a hundred times. I don't know if you know this, but Rose Bearman wrote her thesis on sifting flour. So no. you're not dealing with any normal human being there. And I mean that in the best <laughs> sense of, of the word normal. Um and, and the thing that's, you know, not may not be so surprising is that my mom thought she was normal you know and the two of them were just kind of like of course <laughs> you're dissecting a, uh, my favorite rose story is that she wanted to buy an oven and she had all these food friends and she lives in the village and so she would make in her apartment the cake batter and she'd get in a taxi and go to one of her friends and stick it in their oven and then test it when it came out to see which oven was the best. And she could never make the cake batter there because it would be different because the water in that apartment would be different. So she always made the cake batter at home, got in a taxi, and that was her, you know. I mean, you are right. That oh, that, and, that, and by the way, that sounds a little blasé <laughs> for, for the rose <laughs> that I came to know. Um, <laughs> Well, she sounds so lazy. Um, so, you know, my mom just baked this steady stream of cakes and, you know, was measuring everything to the gram, and those were really sublime. So were you rebelling against this? Were you cooking with her? No. Were you, were you eating it and saying, gee, Mom, this is great, what's your next book? No, none of those things, honestly. I wasn't, uh, 
you know, I've, I've met so many kids today, you know, 12 year olds that say, I know I want to be a chef. I know already. And so I didn't and didn't, didn't give it an, an, any thought and, and would really like to sit here and say to you, you know what, from the minute I was eight, I knew uh, it would be utterly a lie. Um, so I didn't look at it in any organized way. What I just, did you want to be when you were eight? I really wanted to be a marine biologist. I want to go in search of that giant squid. I like sharks a lot. Um, I might have been an ichthyologist, I think. I think I would have really gone into that field. Um, Why didn't you? I think I decided I'd rather cook it than study it. <laughs> I think that's what happened. <laughs> so, uh, so it was a marine biologist, yeah. Oh, yeah, I really, yeah. I loved, I just, I'm particularly fascinated with sharks. And meanwhile, I can't go in over my shins in the ocean without quivering in fear. That's probably another reason. Um, but when is I was this from watching Jaws or something, like that? it is, and it's also I think, and then this may sound crazy, but I don't think uh, I've cut and cooked so much fish that I sort of feel like karma payback would come if I went swimming. You know, like <laughs> she's finally here. No, I mean it, and, no, and no, no, yeah, no, no, totally. No, no, no. That that girl in the beginning of Jaws running on the beach. Yeah. I mean, I don't have that bathing suit or that that bikini body, but but I've got all the trappings of of that woman nonetheless. Yeah. So um, I, I wanted to be a marine biologist, um, but I'm not scientifically inclined beyond mm -hmm. biology, mm -hmm. um, and I, I don't... And they don't teach it at Barnard. Funny, I never... I don't think I paid any attention to what you could or couldn't study, and I also don't think that I really linked my education to what I was going to do with my life so after the fact. How did you wind up at Barnard? Um, I went to Horace Mann in the Bronx, and... Uh, Applied to a number of schools, didn't get into a lot of them, let me tell you. So there was a little bit of a panic attack because my parents are total academics. I mean, everything mm -hmm. is What'd academia. Your father do? My father's a retired professor of history. Oh. Um, so, um, you know, I wrote the application to Barnard, and I think because I didn't really, wasn't even really terribly aware of what it was because it was so nearby. I grew up in Midtown Manhattan. You know, sort of like, oh, you never go to the coffee shop that's on your corner. Right. You know, you, you live there. Right. So it's sort of like that, and then all of a sudden I was kind of realized what kind of environment Barnard was and what it had to offer and mm -hmm. s tried to shape up in a hurry. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I just, I thought, well, I really love New York, and I want to I wanna be here, you know. It, and my parents said, you know, we don't want you to live at home. We don't expect you to, you know, you can act like you're off at college even though you're nearby, and I did. Um, and I studied art history because I liked, I always liked art, and I like, I like going to the museum. I like looking at paintings. Mm -hmm. I didn't make my decision with any more complexity than that. Again, an answer, much more um, sort of informed answer is what I would like to give you, and it just would be a lie. No, you know what, I think everybody's thinking from the minute you're born, you have to get on the career track, and everybody should know what they're doing, and the, the efficiency has to be there. And that's not what education is. Education's supposed to be, I don't know what I am, I need to be opened and exposed to all these different, you know, new things. And it strikes me that, and it, you can hear it in your voice and just your attitude, that you're a highly evolved, educated person. And isn't that what college is supposed to be about? I mean, I, I think so. I keep telling my daughters in college now, I keep saying, she goes, oh, I don't know what to, I said, take everything. This is your time to experiment, try, yeah. try different courses. You don't know what you're going to like. You know, you can, you don't, you have the privilege, you, you know, that you can take a few years and study a lot of different things. But anyway, getting back, so where were you eating up in Morningside Heights? Uh, I'm sure that food... Oh my God, I, I was, I had no money. So I, <coughs> I ate ramen noodles, I ate rice aroni. I I ate a lot of fruit. I ate a lot of Captain Crunch. I'm not going to lie. I really did. I ate, I ate like your classic college student in it so, to gain so the freshman did, 20. So when you left uh, home, it wasn't, oh, I miss mom's, uh, uh, you know, mm -hmm. doll. <laughs> you, you just... No, I think I thought it was refreshing, actually, not to, you know, think so much about it and not have everything I eat be so cerebral mm -hmm. or informed with 400 years of history. Right. Um, but I mean, I went home and my mom was cooking when I was in school, and I cooked a lot in my dorm room. I cooked, I made a lot of lasagna, I baked cakes, I did stuff like that when I felt like it. Mm. <laughs> and by the way, I would, I would cook a bunch of stuff, and then I wouldn't cook for three weeks, and right. then I would pick it up again. So, like anything else, it ebbs and flows. Right. Right. Um, so when you got out of college, what did you do? 
I thought, well, what the hell am I going to do now? You know, exactly. I mean, like any really college graduate, except if they started at eight years old and were on a career track. Yeah, um, but I, I recognize now that I'm so glad I had the freedom of getting an education without being encumbered by these thoughts of what I actually intended to do with it. I never for once thought that I would do anything in the field of art history. I think vaguely I had a fantasy when I was a sophomore in college that I would restore the Sistine ceiling single-handedly and that I would, you know, win an Oscar and just everybody would love me and I would be the president and the queen of England and all those other things. Um, but I was otherwise really unencumbered when I, when I got my education. I'm glad for that. Um, and art history is an excellent major because you can nap in the dark during the slideshows <laughs> after lunch. <laughs> And I did a lot of that. I napped a, a lot. I woke up, you know, usually I fell asleep when they were going over the Parmigianino slides. And by the time I woke up, we were all the way at Monet. So I made sure I missed that little chunk there in the middle. Um, it's only a few hundred years. And right. then, um, so you and knew you, would, you didn't want to teach, right? I did, actually. I, I think I thought when well, my father was such a good teacher, I think... I think that was probably on my to-do list or hope, you know, that... But I think I also imagined that in many fields you end up teaching in some form or another, whether formally or not. Um, but I just... I woke up on graduation day and I said, you know what, you're going to pick your career by the end of the day and that's it. You have one day to pick it and that's it. You're kidding me. No, and I woke up and I said, I don't really like to do anything and I don't want to do anything, um, but I do like to cook. So, And my father always said, just... Imagine, pick something that you know you wouldn't mind doing 12 hours a day. He's because that's what it ends up being. He said, and, and ideally, you should like it. Oh, well, so simple and to the point. And so I thought, well, I kind of like cooking, you know, I think that would be cool. And it's easy. Oh my god, can you believe I said that? <laughs> that shows you how naive you are. Oh, I was, it's easy. It's easy to watch your mom cook in, the, in, a, in an apartment where. That's it's right. Therapy, it's you know, it's therapy. It's a huge difference to professional cooking. Well, look, we're going to have to take a little break here. And when okay. we come back, we're going to talk about how you got into professional cooking. Welcome back. I'm Steve Jenkins from Fairway Markets. I've devoted my idiot career to the old ways, the old recipes, the old tools, the old geography of where serious foods come from for centuries. And I've strived to make these wonderful things available to New Yorkers for 37 years. So it's a fait accompli for us to support Heritage Radio Network. And I hope you will too, and I hope you'll keep tuning in. For more information, please visit fairwaymarket.com. Listening to Chef Story, and this is Dorothy Can Hamilton, and today my guest is Alex Granichelli, and we're at the International Culinary Center, and we're just getting into your professional life. So you're out of Barnard, you decided to cook. How do you how'd you go about it? Because back in those days, it wasn't the world was not a cooking oyster for a woman. You know, yeah, it wasn't I, that easy to go in the kitchens you went into. So t- Pray tell. How did what were spoken, you, what was your first step? Spoken from one woman to another. Yeah. I, I could say the same back at you for the path you've carved, but since you're hosting and we're talking about me, I'll, I'll just I'll give you a knowing Wait, get glance. Get your own show, Alex. A get moment of silence show. for the knowing glance that occurred. Uh, I think the so I guess my answer is uh, how how do you, what do you what prescription do you offer with your story? And mine would be that I never really uh, thought about it. You know, and I think that's probably very complex and hard to do now. It was hard then. And sometimes it just smacks you in the face, so you move on, or you don't. You know, um, I think I mentioned in my cookbook that um, 
the second day I was at Guy Savoie in Paris, which was then a two-star and then became a three-star Michelin. It was like 1992 or three. And the guy said to me at the base of the staircase, um, one of the cooks said, um, I don't know what's worse, that you're f- uh, American or that you're a woman. <laughs> and I thought, well, he's really doing some math here. You know, like he's actually like, hmm, pros and He probably had some columns. He made a list of pros and cons. And I thought, well, that's sort of compelling, you know, that that they don't know what's worse. And, you know, the French, you know, they can be, they are how they are. Um, when you master their language and you're able to really communicate with them, they, it gets a lot better. Um, and, of course, I didn't really have a mastery of the language. So I guess when you say, how did I work in those kitchens, um, I decided that you had two ways of looking at being at a, bl- a black sheep. I mean, I couldn't really... No, wait, wait, wait. How did you get to Gisela? Oh, so, well, I started at Larry Forge Jones. My mom said, I think before you spend the money on culinary school and you go into debt to do that, you should see if it's actually a field you want to work in, which was so smart. And, and I mean, advice that I've given a million times over, go and work in a kitchen for a couple days and see if you actually like it. Because I think it's kind of like one of those environments that you either feel feverishly excited about and, or maybe moderately excited or curious. You don't have to be thrilled. You know, I feel like there's this whole idea that we have to be thrilled all the time about cooking. And it's okay, I think, sometimes to maybe not be so sure. But I think you can also discover whether, you know, that it's just not for you. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think, you know, when people go to school, I think school is critical. I, I would say 20 years ago I used to say to people, oh, you don't have to go to culinary school. Just go immerse yourself somewhere. I there's that n- big debate today. So now how are you coming down on no, it? No, there's no debate for me anymore. Why? What is it about school? Um, I think you need the the formality of the education in a way that um, I think you need a structured, um, gradual, layered understanding of cooking techniques, in, and then you can do whatever you want. Um, I don't think just because you cooked a thousand chickens that you are better off than the person who's sitting in a classroom learning about mother sauces. And I think you'll always have a chance to cook a thousand chickens, now won't you? Mm-hmm. Um, the question is, what happens when the chef is sick and you have to make the sauces? All of a sudden, that notebook of mother sauces and all those resources feed your imagination. Because you take that foundation of knowledge, you go into the refrigerator and you say, well, this is what I have, and, and then here inside of me is what I know. Mm-hmm. And then you can mix the two and you end up with 80 choices mm-hmm. instead of maybe 10 or 15 that are maybe more mimicking or imitating what you have only seen in the environment where you're working. So I think, you know, it feeds your imagination and it gives you sort of like a blueprint Mm -hmm. of knowledge that I think, you know, that's not to say that everybody has to cook French food, you know, but I think think it kind of begins with an understanding of all those techniques. Well, you know, I think one of the things that uh, people don't realize is uh, the great chefs of Europe went through a formal apprenticeship which was like a school. Totally. And they went through all the different uh, areas they had to, with all the different skill sets that were the basic foundation. And that's what a good school does, is it takes all those things and squishes them down into a digestible format. That's in school. And uh, you're not doing production for the restaurant, but you're learning those foundations. And I know in the first month here, you get 250 skill sets, techniques, and, it, and they have to be learned in layers. That's right. Know? That's the important and, and thing. That's, and if you don't learn it in its right sequence, you're not going to master it because it, it takes a few things underneath. So it isn't that the school and working in someone's kitchen, because a lot of the skill sets don't get, if you're in a fish kitchen, <laughs> you know, you're that's only going to learn fish. And, and so I think that debate will take that offline, too, is, is a much more um, complex debate than people are saying, go oh, to yeah. school or learn, in a, learn on the job. It's expensive. It, the school is expensive, and the on-the-job is hit and miss on how much you're That's it. Well, exactly. And, and, and that equation is, is what people debate. Right. There's right. no debate for me. Right. But... Um, I want to say you got to know whether you want to make the commitment and I think you can really learn if you look at what you're going to do after you get out of school for a minute first right. and people say well how do I do that <coughs> I mean I have people email me and say I'd like to come down and just work in your kitchen for a night or two or during the day or whatever 
I mean, I just think there are a million ways to kind of expose yourself to the field of cooking and see if you really love it. And I think you should do that first. I really do. Right. I think anybody should. And so my mom said, well, go down there and just say you'll work for free. And what are they going to say? No, we don't want you to work for free. Right. And that's what I did. I went down there and I said, how are you? And I'd like to work for free and just learn. And they put me in the pastry to start. And I, oh, man, I mean... I made so many mistakes. I overcooked so much creme anglaise. I burned so many cookies. I, you know, I made all the classic made, mistakes. You weren't free. You were a liability. Well, I was conservative. I was smart enough to be conservative with my movements and all everything right. else. Right. I was. And I think I was so overwhelmed that um, I couldn't have ever been categorized as having a bad attitude. And I think mm. that that's a lot of it. Oh, you have to remember huge. what a social environment a kitchen is. I mean, being a chef is also being a plumber, an electrician, a counselor, all those other things, but what you're doing is holding together a social network of people and saying, keeping them motivated towards the goal of collaborating to get through dinner service every day. Um, to me, that's actually the, the number one thing. Uh, and, to, and to be hopefully inspired in some way that so resonates. You went to Love Her In. I did. How was that? Well, after a year and a half with Larry Forgion, he said, you need to go to France. He didn't say, you need to go wherever you want, go into the world, this, that. He said, you need to go to France. And I said, why France? And he said, because you've got to see what the world was, is like if it were perfect. Wow. And I thought, well, that's an interesting. It was so compelling to me. Mm -hmm. um, and I had taken French in college and high school. So I think I sort of thought, well, I kind of can wing it over there. Yeah. I think that's how that kind of magically happened. So I applied to Leverin for the work-study program, thinking, you know what, I'm going to go there, and I'm going to save some cash, and I'm going to see w what the world has to offer. So it was the Leverin campus in Burgundy that I actually oh, went to, not Chateau the one on the, in the Rue Saint-Dominique. Um, I went to the Chateau du Fay, and I lived there for nine months. Um, and I got a, a grand diploma from Leverin, mm. um, done partially through a lot of heavy dish doing and Pinot Noir drinking. <laughs> And a lot of it. Oh, you from, poor dear! Yeah. Oh my God! I it was so, so hard biting into that shower and drinking that uh, Chardonnay was a really rough life. But I worked very hard, and I was with a group of really fun people, and I got a degree, and I learned really. You know, I learned about, you know, from shoe pastry to Bernays. I really learned all the classics done. You know, taught to me, and just you know, with French ingredients in France. I mean, kind of hard to beat. In the countryside. So good. I remember visiting Anne there once, and she had a sack of snails, and they all got out. I don't know if you were around then. And they were in every nook and cranny, you know. And they I'm were not supposed surprised. to be for cooking. <laughs> it was, anyway, let's. So, so uh, then you went to Guisevoa. You also worked for um, other people over there, didn't you? Yeah, I worked for another chef in by the French Alps for a while, and then I made my way up to Paris, and I was actually going to come home. Because I was really broke and kind of grumpy and tired, and I wanted a bagel. and <laughs> I really did. I just wanted a bagel. And yeah. um, my parents said to me, bagels will be here when you get back. Relax. So um, my mom said, you know, Patricia Wells, my author, can probably get you into work at Quisavoie for a day or two. Go up there and do that, and then come home. So I bought a plane ticket. I arranged to work at Quisavoie for a couple days through Patricia Wells. And he actually wasn't there the first day. So the second day I came in, and I was sort of thinking, I don't really want to leave this place. I really kind of liked it, even though I have to tell you, friendlier places I have seen. <laughs> um, but I, was, I found the whole thing so compelling. It was like an orchestra. Um, and there were like 27 guys in there. And I just thought, how did 27 people? I mean, they stood side by side, you know, like cooped up chickens. And they just worked. And what they, it was so graceful. What was the day like? What was the work day? What were the hours? I think I worked, well, I worked, uh, I usually got there around 7, 7 or 8 a.m. And we would uh, prep. And then we'd have lunch from, say, noon to 2.30 or 3, sometimes 3.30. And then we would really, we would clean down the kitchen and take a break from, like, 3.30 to 5. What would you do on your break? I would drink Coca-Cola, and I think, you know, I wasn't at the time a coffee drinker at all, and I think I just needed, you know, caffeine. Um, I would walk around Paris. I would. I went to the Avenue des Terres, you know, on the 17th, and I would go to the little market and eat a piece of cheese or some bread or whatever. I mean, everything was so good. I would go to a bakery, um, and then I would go back, and it would be, we would eat dinner and have, for five minutes. Right. Um, and then... Um, have dinner service, be done like 11.30, clean up, 
and go home and then come back and do the same thing. Physically, how hard was it? It was really, um, it was grueling. Um, but, it, you know, again, I didn't really notice because I, I liked it, you know, and it just felt natural. Um, but, yes, it, it, was, it was a lot physically. It was. And there were, you know, it was copper pots. And you say, okay, well, big, what's the difference? Well, they're really heavy. So everything was cooked in copper. So if you wanted to heat up water or you wanted to saute an egg or saute in some vegetables or fry an egg or cook a 30-pound fish, you were doing any of that in copper, and it made the the lifting, especially with the water in there. Yeah, right. Exactly. Boiling water was, you know, let's hope we don't have to boil water today, folks. Which is an absurd thing so to say. So, when you came back to the states, having that kind of French pedigree, and, and there's a discipline there, and in, in the work stamina thing. Where did you Where did you go to work oh, here? Oh, please. And, and what was it like? And how did you feel? I Good. didn't have any choices, as far as I mean, you know, when you, when you know. I went straight to Danielle Ballou. My mom took me there for lunch. Um, I left my resume in the kitchen. And Alex Lee, the chef at that time at Danielle, had come to eat at Savoy years before. And I guess one of the service staff told him there was an American in the kitchen and a woman to boot. I guess he told, they told him. So they came back and said to me, Alex Lee is in the dining room eating. And I said, I don't know who that is. And they said, well, he wants to meet you. And I, I said, okay. So I went out, and he said, I'm Alex Lee. I'm the chef at Danielle. When you're done here, come back and work at Danielle. And he gave me his card. And I kept it in my wallet um, for about three and a half years because that's how lo- much longer I stayed in France, maybe four years. I don't really remember exactly. So, I mean, I sort of, like, fished that dirty card out of my wallet. I mean, dirty because it had yeah, been it'd sitting be there. there forever. And I went there, you know, like, well, where else am I going to go? And uh, they hired me, and I worked at I worked for Danielle for two years, and then I thought I've had enough of Team French Delicious, <laughs> and I need a break. So I bought a, pl- a one way plane ticket to California, and I um, got a job at uh, Patina in Los oh. Angeles, which was at the time a small a small restaurant on Melrose Avenue um, in Hollywood, and uh, worked there with a colleague who I had worked with at Danielle, and who had worked at Charlie Trotter, Chef David Myers who has a new restaurant called Hinoki and the Bird in uh, Century City in Los Angeles. And we worked together there for two years, and then I thought, well, this is so beautiful, and I love all these heirloom tomatoes, and I love how happy everybody is, but I, I must go back to New York. My bagel, my bagel. Yeah, I just, I'm, an, I'm a New Yorker. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I came back and I worked, um, Joe Kim opened a steakhouse with Restaurant Associates in the base of Madison Square Garden. Um, and I said, uh, if you pay for my move back, I'll work there you know, sort of penance. And I didn't have the money, honestly. Mm-hmm. So there was the motive. Well, what drove you? Well, cash. <laughs> um, the great elixir. <laughs> so I worked there for uh, about a year, I think. I don't really remember. And if you don't have anything nice to say, I suppose don't say anything. Um, so, <laughs> but after that, I became a private chef for a while. And I started teaching it at ICE. Uh, and I did that for a while. But I just, I, I think I kind of... So my colleague at ICE said, you know, you, you've got to go down to Butter. They're looking for a chef. And I said, I don't want to work there. And they said, well, just go and eat dinner. And I went and ate dinner. And it seemed like a lovely place, but it just seemed sort of misguided and confusing to me. But albeit beautiful. Mm-hmm. But I went back in the kitchen, and I saw this one cook. He was cooking scallops. And he turned around, and he was smiling. And I realized he was smiling because he was enjoying the sensation of the sizzling pan and the scallops. And it was making him happy. And I thought, that's it. Sold. Um, and that was 11 years ago. Wow. Wow. All right. Well, we're going to take a little break here. When we come back, we're going to ask you what's professional life, what's single mom, and how do you have it all? Welcome back. You're listening to Chef Story. I'm Dorothy Hamilton, and today my guest is Alex Cornicelli. We finally got to the stage. She's the executive chef. Let me just, how many female executive chefs are there in New York City today? That, uh, you know, what percentage of chefs do you think are female? You know, st- female? statistically, I don't know. I mean, I think I'm the wrong person to ask because I think I go out of my way to make sure I know of them or know about that. So maybe as a woman, I look more for it. Yeah. And I, I'm, I'm impressed 
and happy to see that there are a lot. There are a lot more, yeah. I also, it's my understanding that female enrollment in culinary schools is, is up. We have always had over 50%. So and interesting. I don't know why, as, you know, we're very few. And our head chef here is a woman, Candy Argandiza. Um, and our head pastry chef is a man. And in That's pastry awesome. school, it's 90% women. Right. You know? So any of you guys out there who want to meet women, go to pastry school. Totally. But, um, but anyway, there, I think uh, there are a number, a lot more uh, female chefs today. But we're not going to get off on, on, on that. What, how do you describe your food at Butter? I describe it as French-American food. Um, and I do that by saying that it's really just French techniques underneath it all, which to me obviously makes it... I mean, I, I think I'm, I'm... Because I was taught this code of cooking, I go by it. Um, and I identify, uh, I guess... I associate defining a cuisine a lot with it, the techniques that, that, that were used to build it. But I use such American ingredients. Um, and a lot of ingredients, I think, that really aren't so great in France. Mm. Um, there are ingredients that aren't so great in France mm-hmm. that we do better here. For example, crab. For example, beef. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. You sure. know that I think, and I think they're inherently. We just kind of say, well, those are American. You Even know, like pork. <coughs> I'll take the pork too. The lamb, I think the French really. Oh. They've got some lamb on them. Let me tell you. But if you said pound for pound, you know, I'd take an American chicken. And I'd take, an, I'd take American beef. Would you really? I would an take an American chicken, chicken over a volaille de breast, but don't, you know, don't tell Georges Blanc. So right. um, I think, um, you know, if you mix French techniques with American ingredients, um, and I think if you have a lot of American um, dishes, then I think that's kind of how you end up, that's you how know, you end French, up defining French it. French technique is technique we have an Italian school now and we have a Spanish school here and and the Italian school studies French, French technique and even when they're in Italy they study French technique and I don't think it's French technique I think the French codified that's right. technique that's what and I that's mean. why it's called French technique so it doesn't necessarily people then think oh is that heavy cream sauce it has nothing to do that's with right. the ingredients and and even Ferran Adria he studied in France technique they all had to study technique, and once you you have to know how to, you know, hold a, a knife. Asian technique is very different. Right. But for Western cuisine, it is the technique that the French codified. So, just between us girls. You know, I no, just no, wanna, no. I think that's my, an that's important my, distinction yeah, to make. Yeah. So I don't. I'm not sure. You, I think you do Alex food. I think there's a real, um, there's a. Sophistication, a nuance, but an elegance in your food. I like vegetables, yeah. I, and thank you for saying that. I, I tell you, Gisevoix uses a lot of vegetables, and so I learned how to really cook vegetables. And I mean, I had uh, one dish had fifteen vegetables on it, and each one was cooked separately, and a lot of them were just blanched, and then just gently tossed together in a little butter and lemon. And I cooked. You know, every ve- I mean, imagine cooking 16 or 15, 15 vegetables one by one in, in different forms. Some were roasted, in some were pots. in copper pots filled with water, yes. Um, so I think I really grew to individu- love, love vegetables for individuality. The other thing is, people would materialize at the back door of Guy Savoie, you know, with a, with a basket of mushrooms, porcini mushrooms. Then someone else would come with a crate of asparagus. You know, there was this. The real understanding of Guy Savoy is a person that would do that, buy all these things individually from people. And so I, got, I was learning seasonality without realizing it. But there was a day when the porcini mushroom stopped, a day when the asparagus began, and those things were really just the way they were. And you didn't, you didn't try to get anything above and beyond. Um, and Danielle is the same way. So, and then I moved to California, so think about that. I mean... All the produce, all the fruits. I mean, I really get kind of nutty when I go to the green market. But I said to Mark Miller a number of years ago, he said, well, how do you define your cooking? And I said, "Uh, I'm inspired by the green market. And he said, that's not a food cooking philosophy. That's a shopping philosophy. And I thought, well, that's brilliant, and I'm going to file that. So I think that made me sort of question, how do you define your cooking? And I think it's not just, yeah, I do think a big part of it is what you buy and where you buy it. Because then that's... That dictates a lot of your choices, I think, you know. 
Um, but I think the codified French technique, uh, definitely a big tip of the hat in the French direction in a lot of ways, mixed with a lot of American ingredients and that sort of love I have of, of American cooking. I mean, if you say you thumbed through Fanny Farmer's cookbook and the joy of cooking, what would you get? You know, would you make a blackberry fool, mm -hmm. you know, as an example? Um, would you make a, you know, a clam chowder? I mean, these are just things I think are very, to me, very American. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're codified in French cooking. They sure are. A creme chantilly, for example, as mm -hmm. part of a fool. The definition of a chowder as including some form of pork product and potatoes. These are definitions we come to understand. And I think it's the, the melding of the two, which is what you grew up you know, sort of exposed to in your universe, external to my mother's garam masalas, mm -hmm. mixed with the techniques and the code of, of cooking and techniques that I learned, um, then that's, I think, how I arrive at my own definition. Wow. That's great. Another hot potato that people talk about is the Food Network being on TV. Oh, yeah, sure. Right. And, and you know, someone like yourself, it's, it's really a shame that all your viewers can't taste your food. Oh, that's so sweet. You know, Thank no, you. truly, because I've known you a long time, and you you are just such a delicious cook, you know. And and I think uh, people on TV are not taken as seriously as chefs, because uh, I tell I agree. you, Bobby Flay is a fantastic. Oh my chef. god, amazing! He is really a. It's uh, crazy, and, and people belittle him because they don't, I don't care. think. I don't. But you know, it's that. So tell me about TV, and and what are the what are the good points what are what's attractive to you about doing tv what are some of the harder things about doing tv um i i, I you know i think you know i'm sure there are many actors that would like to make different movies than the ones they make <laughs> um and i think that you know you end up going into something like this thinking cool i'm gonna get to kind of share who i am and my points of view and of course you know that's a complex thing Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't always happen that way. And then some things are accidents. That, you know, that when I started on Chopped, I never dreamed that it would be sort of educational. But I think, you know, I get so much mail from people about, uh, I never knew this ingredient existed. And now I went out and bought it, and because of what I saw on Chopped and the explanation, I tried it and I love it. And I just thought, well, you know, I thought people would be so caught up in the clock's running out and his leg fell off and whatever else that... The, the other stuff about the cooking and the ingredients will get lost in the shuffle, but it really hasn't. And so there's ways that, that things accidentally educate, um, um, and I really like that. I like that about the power of television, that it can educate, that we can share common experiences. I like competition shows because I think that they show the human side of people, that people are fallible, that they make mistakes, that people crave being a hero, they crave finding a hero. I, mean, I think an Iron Chef is kind of a hero for me. Watching Morimoto make sushi that looks like a stained glass window in a church is just, you know, a memorable moment. Watching Mario Batali burn grappa on the inside of a bowl of Parmigiano Reggiano to, you know, that, that wheel he carved um, to make a bowl for tossing pasta. I mean, they're just iconic things that sort of made me realize that the possibilities are endless and that imagination is exciting to watch when it's not your own. Um, so I like uh, the power of all those things. Does that mean that I like all food television? No. Um, but I don't like all books. I don't like all movies. Absolutely. I don't like all anything. Absolutely. And I would say when you go on television, I think you have to to some extent accept, accept that people are going to pigeonhole right. you or see you a certain way. Um, I can't really worry about that, um, provided I'm okay with who I am and what I'm doing myself, right. which is a tough audience. You know, your internal <laughs> audience is your it's, toughest. It is. So if someone's going to take pot shots at me, well, they're probably not any worse than the pot shots I've taken at one point or another at myself. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested in negotiating a relationship with my inner me mm -hmm. that's okay with my outer doings right. more than anything else. Yeah. But Bobby Flay, uniquely... Uh, when he cooks, it's kind of crazy. It's crazy. And you talk to him while he's cooking, and he starts out engaged, and then he just says, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And it's like he gets lulled into the heat of the cooking in the kitchen and whatever else. And that guy, I mean, I've watched him cook, and I've eaten, you know, he's cooked something and then handed it to me, and it's just, you know, how'd you do that? Oh, wait a minute. All that was was that and that. How does it taste like this? You know what? I, I remember Jacques Pepin um he was taking a lot of heat from some other chefs because he didn't have a restaurant. And they said, oh, you don't have a restaurant. You know, are you really a chef anymore? And he looked at them and he says, you know, I cook more than you do. 
I'm doing cooking schools. I'm doing um, on a TV show. I'm cooking. You guys now are all executive chefs. You don't even pick up a knife or a pan anymore. I think there's a certain um, idea, a chef's code of what's uh, okay. And chefs need to sit in their restaurants day and night, even if they're walking around with a clipboard drinking coffee right. in their restaurants. And I will say I, I agree that uh, the presence of the chef or the absence of the chef is felt yes. in restaurants, yeah. and uh, my, my own and myself included. Mm-hmm. Um, there are times when I get too far away from the restaurant and I say, i got to come back to it. i got to right. go back. I, you know, it's like a fish that the salmon knows it's got to swim upstream mm-hmm. and do what it's got to do. Uh, I think, you know, chefs... And then, you know, that, that, that uh, smacks right up against this wall, this idea that, you know, let's bring the chef out of the kitchen. Let's put him on TV. Let's get him walking around. Let's do this, that. You know, I, 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 don't, you know, I don't agree with that either. So I have this push-pull internal argument with myself as well, but I'll say this. I enjoy being on TV, and I enjoy the shows that I'm in. I really do. I love Iron Chef America. I love Chopped. Um, I love my cooking show, Alex's Day Off. Um, I watch the Food Network at home recreationally. My daughter likes Ina Garten the most. She doesn't like me that much, <laughs> which I how think is, is funny. How is it being, a lot of people, how is it being a mom chef? She, you know, my daughter walks around and says, my mom's a chef and I'm a chef too, and I just think that's the cutest. Um, I don't know, I think, uh, uh, you know, again, remember I said I didn't know I grew up with someone iconic, yeah. so yeah. they were just mom. Yeah. I'm definitely just mom to my daughter. And she says, well, you made something kind of delicious today, mom. And then sometimes she looks at me and says, can't you just order Chinese food? Can't we just, <laughs> can we have a bag of Doritos? And I say, totally, let's do it. Yeah. So, do you um, bring her to the restaurant? Is she in the sometimes kitchen with you? She came, she used to come a little bit more, but she cut her finger. She nicked Ooh. it cutting some carrots, and so she's been a little standoffish with me lately, but I have high hopes moving forward. What, what happens after school? I mean, in the evenings, you have to be in the, in the kitchen. And, I, mean, I stay home, and I cook dinner for her because she eats early. Uh, right. um, so I cook, and we eat, and we hang out a little bit in the afternoon when she's done, and then I go to work. And some nights I don't go to work. Actually, I just hang out with her. mom. You can, the hours off in between services, yeah. What doesn't end up being so convenient to normal people is perfectly okay by me. Right. Well, actually, we've got to get you out of here so you don't pick up your daughter <laughs> from school. True. This is this is great. It's been wonderful A pleasure. speaking to you, really. I Thank mean, you. You are an icon for so many people out there. And I Thank love you. your I love your philosophy of life. I love your take on the profession. I think... I really expect a lot more greatness from you, Alex. Well, the feeling's mutual. <laughs> okay, mutual. Gotta okay, go have a drink. Okay, <laughs> nice to see you. Thanks for listening to Chef Story. A shout out to Jack Insley and Robin Cohen, my producers, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to this program on HeritageRadioNetwork.org. You can find all of our archived programs on our website or as podcasts in the iTunes Store by searching Heritage Radio Network. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Heritage underscore Radio. You can email us questions at any time at info at heritageradionetwork.org. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization. To donate and become a member, visit our website today. Thanks for listening. Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like, Earl Butts, get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then like how how that all came to be. 
and realize like, wow, like this piece of legislation, all this money, like it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next farm bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to the Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts.